Let's take a look at the endocrine and some of the drugs that are used for the endocrine system. So we're talking about bodily control of pretty much all mechanisms in the body. We're talking about the endocrine system and the nervous system working together to create that bodily control. And when we're talking about all of it and how well it's coordinated, we're going to look at the hypothalamus in the brain. So if we look at this image here, the hypothalamus is this small little area just um, essentially at the base of the brain or the outside of the brain there. And the hypothalamus is the coordinator of all of the endocrine and the nervous system functions. So the endocrine system, we're typically talking about the pancreas, the thyroid gland, and the adrenal glands. Pancreas, of course, has a role with um, blood glucose regulation through secretion of insulin. The thyroid gland has a function, a huge function in the body that overall dictates metabolism. And the adrenal glands regulate blood pressure and help the body um, balance electrolytes and respond to stress. Furthermore, we could generally talk about any hormone producing gland or hormone producing organs such as the ovaries, the testicles, and then things like the prostate as well are often classified as part of the endocrine system. So we'll look at those ones in a separate presentation and we'll focus here on the thyroid gland, adrenal glands, and the pancreas. So we're talking about the endocrine system. The way it works, it's based on what we call a negative feedback loop. So we have a master gland that signals to another gland to produce a hormone. The hormone then is circulated in the bloodstream and essentially that blood is kind of sampled by the master gland or signals are sent back up to the master gland to identify how much of that hormone is circulating in the blood. And then from there, the master gland identifies if it needs to produce more hormones or less hormones in order to maintain homeostasis. So the good analogy here, we can talk about it in terms of a furnace and a thermostat. The furnace, when it kicks on, it's sending out heat, and of course, when the room is bathed in heat, it influences the thermostat. The thermostat reading is then sent back to the furnace, and of course, if the room is warm enough, then the furnace will shut off. That overall is a negative feedback loop, and the endocrine system relies heavily on a fully functioning negative feedback loop. However, the reality is it's not quite as simple as that one-to-one -one mechanism of the furnace and the thermostat. Quite often we're talking about a master gland that then secretes hormones that affect a subsequent gland. That one secretes hormones that, or that affect another subsequent gland and so on. And then it gets fed back, looped back up and determine how much of each hormone is needed. We'll have a look at the thyroid gland to start with. So we're going to look at thyroid function overall. So when we're talking about thyroid functions, we're talking about the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and of course the thyroid gland. So under the influence, well actually we can start at the beginning. So when low concentrations of thyroid hormone are present in the blood, and when we're talking about thyroid hormone, we're talking about T3, T4, which are the thyroid hormone with an addition of iodine molecules. So when the there are low concentrations of the thyroid hormone in the blood, the hypothalamus, so right at the top in the brain, releases a stimulating hormone called thyrotropin releasing hormone or TRH. That function is to stimulate the pituitary gland, so the subsequent gland there, the pituitary gland, to release thyroid stimulating hormone. Under the influence of the pituitary gland's thyroid stimulating hormone, follicular cells of the thyroid gland absorb iodine and they incorporate it into tyrosine molecules to produce two thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. The numbers three and four just reflect the amount of iodine on the molecule. So if it ha or, yeah, on the molecule, so if it has three or four parts iodine. Then T3 and T4 molecules are released into circulation and taken up by cells in the body. So the, all the body, all the organs in the body use T3 and T4 for function. Once taken up, T4 is converted by tissues into T3 and it removes one um, iodine ion or iodine molecule in the process. The T3 form is the physiological, or sorry, the physi physiologically active form of the hormone and causes the changes associated with thyroid hormones. Circulating T4 levels provide the negative feedback to the hypothalamus and pituitary to decrease the release of TRH and TSH.
So looking at it, it's a continuous feedback loop, and the end goal is, of course, to produce T3 and T4, which get circulated through the bloodstream to the various organs of the body for them to be able to function. So looking at thyroid disease, specifically we're talking about hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, we're talking mostly about cats. There are rare instances that dogs can get hyperthyroidism. And likewise with hypothyroidism, we're talking about dogs. And in very rare instances, we're talking about cats. So we have three general forms or three versions of this kind of disease. We have primary, secondary, or tertiary hyper or hypothyroidism. The stars should be a little bit lower, but primary thyroid gland is not functioning. So in primary thyroid disease, the thyroid gland itself is not functioning. Secondary, the pituitary gland is not functioning appropriately, and tertiary, the hypothalamus is not functioning appropriately. So primary thyroid gland uh, lack of function is the best one to have. It's going to have the least amount of overall impact on the body. It still will very much impact the body. However, the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus play regulatory roles in many other hormone secreting um, glands throughout the body. So they play a bigger role. So if they're not working, they can affect way more systems in the body than just the endocrine system. So primary hypo or hyperthyroidism is more ideal than secondary or tertiary. We'll take a look at hypothyroidism. So again, we're typically looking at dogs. Number one cause is lymphocytic thyroiditis, and this is when the immune system is actually attacking the thyroid gland and not allowing it to uh, produce the hormones appropriately. The second most common is idiopathic thyroid gland atrophy, which of course idiopathic means we don't know why it's happening, and the thyroid gland tissue is replaced by fat. So we don't quite know why it's happening, but those two overall account for 95% of all hypothyroid cases. And if you just look at this dog here, he has that really severe uh, look of hypothyroidism where the skin, the connective tissue and the musculature of his face is starting to sag and droop and they start to get these kind of angry eyebrows. That's classical symptom of long-term hypothyroidism. So looking at our clinical signs of hypothyroidism, now hypothyroidism typically starts sort of middle-aged dogs. It can be anywhere from four to six years old. It's not an old dog disease. So they tend to have decreased activity or are mentally dull. They typically have weight gain or obesity. They can have hair loss, excessive shedding or hair loss, dull, greasy hair, thick, dry, scaly skin, dry eyes. You can see chronic ear infections. And in some cases, you see bradycardia, which in a dog, depending on the breed of dog, but it's less than 80 beats per minute. So they kind of look a little bit um, yucky, especially if it's very long-term or pronounced hypothyroidism. So it's the kind of dog that you pet, you feel bad for the dog, and then you quickly wash your hands because they're kind of greasy <laughs> with the dog's fur and skin. In foals, so fo uh, horses pretty much, um, from what I understand and what I've read, horses generally can do okay being hypothyroid. They don't show the signs and symptoms as severely as dogs do. However, if a female mare is pregnant and hypothyroid and, and has hypothyroidism and she gives birth to a foal, then the foal is at risk of also having sort of complications associated with hypothyroidism. So common findings in foals that are born to hypothyroid mares are contracted tendons and poor development of the respiratory epithelium. These offspring typically have poor central nervous system function and development, and they tend to look lethargic, uncoordinated, and dull. So if that can be corrected, then that's ideal and they can carry on, but of course the vet has to recognize specifically what process is going on in order to correct it. And then in regard to the contracted tendons, things like uh, braces and orthotic devices can be used to help elongate and stretch out those contracted tendons. Treatment, of course, after thyroid blood testing is completed, so we would be checking a free T4 plus or minus a thyroid stimulation or a thyroid stimulating hormone stim test, so TSH stim test. The treatment itself, typically most common, is synthetic levothyroxine, so synthetic T4. 
hormone is supplemented and it's oral dosing. It's SID to BID. Recommendation in general is to start with a trusted brand name and then once the dog becomes regulated on this medication, you can switch to a compounded version to save a bit of money. This is a lifelong treatment and the goal is not to fix the thyroid itself, but it's just to synthesize and replicate that hormone that needs to be floating around the body in order for the organs to function appropriately and for the metabolism to maintain itself. So this is the most common one that you'll see, levothyroxine sodium tablets, and it is called Thyrotab. Always be cautious with the strength if you're the RVT that's dispensing it because they range from 0.1 to 0.8 milligrams. So that's something very important to keep in mind. Precautions with this medication. Toxicity, so overdose of this medication is not as high of a concern in animals as it is with people for this specific medication. It has a very large margin of safety. One thing that we do have to be cautious of is diabetics. We have to increase their insulin during treatment or there's potential that we have to increase their insulin during treatment. So what's recommended is when they're starting on their thyroid medication, their synthetic T4 hormone, we need to ensure that that dog, typically it's a dog, has blood glucose is checked regularly to see how well the insulin is keeping up. Because using this medication, it increases the absorption of glucose from the gastrointestinal tract, it increases the conversion of protein to glucose, and it changes liver glycogen stores into glucose. So remember that we're increasing metabolism. We're speeding things back up to the normal way that they should be. So if that dog has been well regulated on insulin for its diabetes for the last year, but it's also been hypothyroid for the last year, then that can really put a big swing on their internal homeostasis of blood glucose. So they should be monitored quite well, especially in those first few weeks on the thyroid medication. After diagnosis, one month after the medication started, we're wanting to check a T4 level of the blood. And we're going to check the level six hours after the administration of the medication because generally we tend to see peak levels around 48 hours after the meds have been given. This specific level of T4 allows us to tailor the dosage of the thyroxine to ensure that the dog's getting enough or not too much in their bloodstream. And then annually, we should always be checking a T4 bare minimum once a year, absolute bare minimum once a year. A goiter, I just wanted to highlight one thing that can happen. So a goiter in an animal who has long-term hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, sometimes we see this thing called a goiter that's associated with the condition. So the goiter is an enlarged thyroid gland, a really severely enlarged thyroid gland, and it's caused by low iodine in the diet. So typically we don't see this in Ontario very often because dogs and cats eat really well-regulated, well-balanced, uh, formulated meals. So we tend to have enough iodine in their daily diets to ensure that the goiter doesn't occur. But in areas where dogs and cats are eating scraps and they're just scavenging for food, there's always a chance that they, they don't get enough iodine in their diet. So with this, they can't manufacture the T3 and the T4 because they need iodine to attach to the, the base pro, uh, proteins of that in order to create that T4 and T3. So in this case, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, they're just identifying that not enough T4 or T3 circulating in the bloodstream. So they, the pituitary gland is going to release tons and tons and tons of that thyroid stimulating hormone. And of course, because those signals are getting sent to the thyroid over time, because the thyroid still can't produce enough T3, T4 because of the lack of iodine, all it does is end up causing proliferation of the thyroid tissue. So the thyroid tissue itself just grows and grows and grows. And of course, they get this big goiter instead. All right, hyperthyroidism. Now, typically we're talking about cats, and I failed to mention this with dogs too, with hypothyroidism. So the instances where a cat can get hypothyroidism is, of course, if we cause it iatrogenically. So if we overtreat with um, uh, hyperthyroidism, if we overtreat with medication for hyperthyroidism, then we can cause them to go hypo. And likewise, if there are, are tumors associated in the brain, then in some rare cases, we can get cats who get hypothyroidism and exactly the same dog with hype dog or exactly the same with dogs becoming hyperthyroidism. 
if they get way too much of their medication or they have sort of an abnormal tumor affecting some of those control locations within the brain, then we could potentially get a hyperthyroid dog. Very rare. So for cats, we're talking about an increase in circulating thyroid hormones. It is primarily cats, as mentioned, and it's typically associated with a thyroid secreting tumor. So if we look at this kitty here, trachea is right through here, and on the left side, you can see an enlargement, and that's an enlarged thyroid. So that's a tumor associated with the thyroid gland. Humans, they tend to get a different type of hyperthyroidism. They tend to get an immune-mediated thyroid condition called Graves' disease. That's a common one. They also can get nodules on their thyroid as well. But cats, we're not talking about the immune-based condition. More often, we're looking at the um, uh, thyroid-secreting tumor. Clinical signs. So for these guys, they have pretty dramatic weight loss, increased heart rate greater than 240, increased hunger, polydipsia, polyuria, and increased activity, so hyperactivity. Typically, clients are bringing these guys in because they are acting like a kitten all of a sudden. They have all this crazy energy all of a sudden. They're just springing off the walls or they're really, really hungry, but they're not gaining any weight because what's happening is their metabolism it has sped up significantly. So they're very hungry, but then they're not actually utilizing that food as well as it should be utilized. And instead, what ends up happening is they get muscle wasting and they get really quite thin. So these poor kitties are, are looking like they're happy and energetic, but in reality, their heart rate's going extremely fast, which of course can lead to cardiac fatigue over time, which would lead to cardiac arrest. So this is all definitely a concern. Sometimes too, clients have reported that their cat's meow has changed. So it's kind of a if they have a tumor on their thyroid gland, then that can impede on the larynx and push into the larynx, which of course changes their pitch of meow. Okay, treatment options. We've got radioactive iodine is a treatment, surgical removal, thyroid suppressant medications, dietary therapy, and that's essentially it. So for my students, I've recommended this uh, hyperlink here. It is the American Association of Feline Practitioners Guidelines for Treatment of Hyperthyroidism in Cats. It's an excellent handout, and it has a whole bunch of information on current uh, recommendations for treatment of hyperthyroidism in cats, and then it has a really great client education sheet. So if you are my student, your homework is to review the client education sheet about these four options and definitely get to know the good side and the bad side of each option. We'll go through them a little bit. So radioactive iodine. Overall, iodine, as mentioned before, is fully absorbed by the thyroid because the thyroid needs iodine in order to create that T3, T4. So when paired with radioactive isotopes, the goal is to inject the cat into the bloodstream with these radioactive isotopes attached to iodine molecules. The iodine goes directly into the thyroid and it fully gets absorbed only by the thyroid gland, not by any other glands in the body, generally. And of course, once it's in the thyroid, then the radioactive isotopes are going to take effect and they start to destroy those cells of the thyroid. So it's tricky because the goal is to administer the smallest dose to remove the neoplastic tissue while avoiding a, an iatrogenic hypothyroidism. So that is the goal, and it's pretty well regulated at this point. It is an IV injection in cats, and it has to be in a designated facility who has licensing for radioactive iodine. So of course, you can imagine some good things about this and some bad things about this. It has a washout period of isolation after the fact because, again, we're looking at a, a radioactive agent. So there has to be a washout period to ensure that that cat is not urinating out radioactive isotopes after the fact at home. And quite often that means that they have to stay in the facility for that period of time. In general, there's greater than 95% success rate with one-time treatment. So just keep that in mind. Those are very positive aspects of the radioactive iodine. And currently, that's as long as the animal is stable otherwise, that's the number one recommended treatment option. Medication. We have methamazole, 
also known as its trade name tapazole or filamazole. Tapazole is the human uh, formulation and filamazole is the feline formulation. This medication works by blocking the thyroid's ability to actually produce T3 and T4. So in actuality, it blocks the incorporation of iodine molecules to the thyroid uh, hormone molecule so that it can't actually create that complete hormone. It's a lifelong medication, and it takes time to see the initial effects. Sometimes it takes weeks, even up to six weeks sometimes to take to start to see the initial effects of these drugs. Sometimes we might recommend, or the doctor might recommend this medication as a short-term solution. If the cat is really thin, if they've had hyperthyroidism for a while, if their heart rate's very, very high, they might not be an ideal candidate for surgery right away or for the radioactive iodine. So sometimes they might start the cat on methamazole for maybe a couple months or six weeks, see if they can bring those thyroid levels down so that they can then be referred for some radioactive iodine therapy or surgical removal. Side effects, roughly 20% of cats will experience vomiting and anorexia, which typically resolves after a few weeks. So we need to tell owners that to expect that that could happen. Definitely let us know we should report it and then carry on and it should just resolve itself. In rare cases, we can get liver disease, so affected livers over time, bleeding and decrease in white blood cells. This drug, because again, it was formulated from the human drug, which is typically based on that immune condition where the immune system's attacking the thyroid, because it's based on that um, aspect of human medicine where it could either be that immune-based or the thyroid tumor itself, it has two properties to it. So it's an immunosuppressive drug, but then it also prevents that combination of the thyroid hormones with the iodine to make complete hormones. So it's something to keep in mind. It is immunosuppressive and especially in higher dosages, it can be immunosuppressive, uh, immunosuppressive. And that's where we typically see that decrease in white blood cells. The other potential treatment. So we know that increased level of thyroid hormones. So a lot of T3, T4 circulating in the bloodstream increases beta receptors on the heart, normal sympathetic nervous system, creates, of course, a normal increase in heart rate and increase in all of those aspects that allow for a degree of fight or flight. When we have an increase in beta receptors in the heart because of this increase in thyroid hormone, then we tend to get an abnormal, really exaggerated response to normal sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So an example of this, for me, I had hyperthyroidism and if somebody scares you, you kind of jump out of your skin a bit and then your heart rate goes up and it quickly calms down. For me at the time, if somebody scared me, my heart rate would jump up over 200, stay over 200 for a period of minutes, and then it would slowly calm down. So instead of having a normal reaction to sympathetic nervous system stimulation, animals who are hyperthyroid end up having an exaggerated reaction, which can be really scary on the heart. If we look at beta-1 antagonists such as propanolol, it prevents epinephrine and norepinephrine from combining with the beta receptors, so it can at least reduce some of those cardiac effects on the body. Monitoring of hyperthyroidism. In general, after the diagnosis, every two to four weeks, we want to look at clinical signs and blood work in order for the first three months in order to establish a really good dose. So it's pretty specific and clients definitely need to be warned about this because there's a cost associated with blood tests, of course. One month after a stable dose of the methamazole has been determined, we should do a kidney panel because kidney disease can be masked by hyperthyroidism. So the medication can result in a decrease in glomerular filtration rate. So one month after, we should check a kidney panel in a CBC, CBC, mostly to ensure that the white blood cells have not been decreased. And then annually, at least, we should be checking a T4 and monitoring for clinical signs throughout the year. Ideally, um, the T4 should be completed more than once a year, but that's kind of baseline to get clients on the right track. Okay, now we'll move on to endocrine pancreatic drugs. So endocrine, when we're talking about the pancreas, we're talking about the hormone, and exocrine, we're talking more about the digestive enzymes and the role it plays in digestion overall. 
So mostly when we're talking about the pancreas in regard to its endocrine function, we're talking about insulin. So insulin is secreted by the pancreas, and the purpose of insulin is to move glucose from the blood into the tissue cells so that the tissues and the organs can actually utilize it. The liver stores glucose as glycogen, and overall it decreases the decrease in blood glucose through enhanced distribution of glucose in the tissues. So insulin is really important in moving that blood glucose around to the liver, to the other organs, to the tissues, so that it doesn't just remain in the bloodstream. So of course we're going to talk about diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus in general is a lack of insulin, and type 1 diabetes refers to low or no insulin, and we call that insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, or IDDM. Type 2 diabetes refers to inadequate or delayed insulin, which is non-insulin dependent. And then just a little reminder that diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with glucose, and diabetes insipidus is the lack of the antidiuretic hormone. So important not to get those ones mixed up. So looking at this little image here, the purple cells in this picture represent the beta cells, and the beta cells are the cells that are responsible for secretion of insulin in response to high blood glucose. So they will secrete the insulin to reduce the amount of glucose in the blood by sending it through to other organs and tissues in the body. So that's important to keep in mind because a lot of the drugs are based on the idea of taking these beta cells from other animals and synthesizing them into a medication for dogs and cats. Overall, when we're talking about insulin, those um, diabetics that are insulin dependent require insulin injections. So insulin injections, typically for long-term use, they go under the skin with a tiny little needle. And it's important to note that insulin doesn't mimic the body's normal production of insulin. So that won't take place entirely, but it allows the body to just sort of regulate more so that blood glucose distribution in slightly different manner. Insulin injections themselves are scheduled and highly regulated. And of course, along with insulin injections, we still have to talk to the client about appropriate diet for their animal. It's likely that they're going to be recommended a prescription diet. And of course, exercise too, because obesity is a determining factor of, of diabetes, especially the insulin-dependent diabetes. So all of this, the insulin injections that are regular and scheduled, the diet and exercise, and overall care and monitoring of their pet, this takes place 24 hours, 7 days a week, 12 months a year, 365 days a year. So this is an every single day thing. So for us as RVTs, it's so important to have these big conversations with the clients and empower them, show them how to give an insulin injection, help them out, coach them, let them know it's okay, they can do it because they need to do this every single day. And if they don't feel empowered and able to do it, then of course the animal's going to suffer in the end. And they will too, because it's their pet. All right, so looking at insulin, it's named or it's sort of classified based on duration of action and where it's derived from. So looking at duration of action, we have short, intermediate, and long-lasting insulin. And then where it's derived from, we have porcine or pork or pig, sorry, beta cells, bovine beta cells, and genetically engineered human type beta cells. So ones that synthesize essentially human beta cells. In dogs and cats in general, especially dogs, there's a closer match with dogs, but in general, the porcine beta cell uh, insulins work best, or they tend to have the most realistic synthesis of effect on the body compared to the bovine and the human type. So our short-acting insulin, the one that you'll see most often in your clinic, we generally just call it regular insulin and it might be called Humulin S. Now just be very careful because there's also a Humulin I and this is called overall regular crystalline and it's for IM, IV, and sub-Q use. So it's one of the rare ones that we use IM, IV, or sub-Q. Typically, you're going to see this most often for initial stabilization of a pet in clinic. So if they're having a hyperglycemic attack and their blood glucose is just crazy, this is one that will give either IM or IV, typically to have a very quick effect on the body. So if we give it IV, 
we have a one to four hour effect. If we give it IM, we have a three to eight hour effect. And of course, sub Q, we have a longer effect up to 10 hours. This is not one that's used for long-term use. It's too short acting. Intermediate acting, these are very common. So we have the type that's called NPH, and the trade name that you'll most often see is Humulin I. This one's common for stabilizing dogs long-term. It's derived from the uh, pig, so porcine, zinc solution, and it has an effect of four to 12 hours in dogs. Lenti is also known as caninsulin, and this is the most common that you're going to see in your vet clinic. So the most common for stabilizing dogs long-term. The other one you might see depending on where you live is vetsulin. I believe that's more so an American brand, but caninsulin is definitely really common in Canada. This one is also porcine drive zinc solution, and it has an 8 to 14 hour effect in cats and a 10 to 24 hour effect in dogs. And then we have long acting insulin. So we have Detamir, which is trade name Levamir. It's a recombinant DNA human origin insulin. It's very, very potent in dogs. So the only instance where we really use this one is if they've already tried NPH and Lenti and they're not having an effect. So it's a very abnormal type of diabetes where they're not being regulated very well with those two types of intermediate acting insulins then this one might be introduced to dogs. But in general, Detamir or Levamir is really never used in dogs because it's just far too potent. It has a 12 to 24 hour effect and typically you're seeing it used in cats, if at all. Glaricine or Lantus. Lantus is very common, especially for cats. It's also a recombinant DNA human origin insulin. And it has a potential option for dogs, but most often we're seeing the caninsulin for dogs and the lantus for cats. It has a 12 to 24 hour effect in cats and a 20 to, or sorry, 12 to 20 hour effect in dogs. And then lastly, we have a PZI, which is called, which the one that we see most often here in Ontario is Prozinc. And Prozinc is making a big comeback onto the markets because there've been really good studies recently about long-term, um, treatment of Prozinc in cats, even to a degree of SID treatments. So Prozinc has a lot of veterinarians rooting behind it right now in Ontario, which is really great because again, if we can control cats on as little medications as possible, then this makes it easier for the clients. So this is another recombinant human DNA origin insulin. It's approved and recommended for cats, and it has an 8 to 24 hour effect in cats. The duration of insulin and the rates of absorption depend on what the insulation or what the insulin is combined with and the solubility of the crystals of insulin. So looking at this little uh, microscope image here on the left, these are insulin crystals. So insulin crystals, when they're left alone in the vial, they will clump together and chunk together. When they are rocked appropriately and um, dissolved, they still maintain their shape and their form, just not in clumps. So the larger crystals are what you'd see in longer acting insulins. And the smaller the crystal, the more readily um, dissolved it is in the tissues and in the bloodstream. So if we think about it, the very, very short acting regular insulin is typically a very highly soluble very, very small crystal type insulin. And then the sizes, of course, increase the longer lasting it is. Most, <clears throat> most common for dogs, NPH and Lenti, which are intermediate acting, uh, as mentioned previously. Cats. Cats are different. There's always controversy in regard to which insulin to use in cats. Cats vary really widely in how they respond to insulin. Can be, some can be really sensitive to the insulin and others can be very res resistant to the insulin effects. Cats are also sneaky because they can progress from type two to type one diabetes or go through periods where they appear to be in remission from diabetes. So with that, if an animal has been having insulin injections regularly because they've always been an insulin-dependent cat, and then all of a sudden they slip into remission and we're still giving insulin, of course the danger with that is that they can slip into a coma because we've suddenly decreased their blood glucose far too much. So cats are a little bit sneaky. They're a little bit more challenging to regulate. They definitely can be regulated. It just takes a little bit more monitoring and consistency than with dogs in general.
Generally as well, insulin has a shorter duration, so a lot of the blood glucose monitoring and blood glucose curves for cats comes into play a fair bit. Looking at administration of insulin, it's very specific. The bottles themselves, so the type of insulin, is listed as U40, U100, or U500, which means the bottle concentration is reflected as 40, 100, or 500 insulin units per millimeter. So U40 is 40 insulin units per millimeter, etc. Milliliter, sorry. Each insulin syringe is calibrated for that specific concentration. So we've got U40 syringes that differ significantly from U100 syringes. This is extremely important for every RVT to be aware of. Be cautious every single darn time you are giving insulin to a patient or every single time you are dispensing a box of syringes for a diabetic patient. I give you general rules like Lenti is typically a U40, Glardine is typically U100, etc., etc. But I don't even I don't want you to rely on those rules to be honest. I want you to actually check the vial of insulin each time, confirm which syringes it goes with, and always get somebody to double check your box of syringes. Unfortunately, I've seen this happen. I knew an RVT who grabbed the wrong box of syringes for his own pet and severely overdosed the dog on insulin, which of course, too much insulin means that the, the animal has zero blood glucose for the organs to utilize and they can slip into a coma, which is really scary. So always get somebody to double check the syringes that you're sending home with a client. And of course, there's no harm in getting somebody to double check your syringe before you actually give a patient some insulin. As mentioned before, the insulin itself is in small little crystals, and of course they can clump together in their, um, in their matrix. So we have to be very cautious to mix the insulin, and essentially we're bringing it up roughly to room temperature as we mix the small vial of insulin. So these are all things that we have to talk to the owner about ahead of time before they actually give the insulin to their pet. So we have to mix it. But we have to be very careful because if we shake the insulin, we're going to break those crystals down into a smaller form, and we know that smaller crystals get absorbed more rapidly, and they're, they're highly soluble. So we don't want to change the availability and the solubility of the insulin itself. That could be detrimental to the animal's health. So what we're going to do, you can remember, rock the babies, don't shake the babies, and we're just going to roll the insulin between two hands. And you're literally just going to roll it for a minute, sometimes two minutes, and just continuously gently roll it and then look at the solution. Is it 100% mixed or are you still seeing clumps of crystals? If you're still seeing clumps of crystals, you need to continue to roll it. So this is very, very important. We need to teach the client this because if they just take it out of the fridge and shake it, then that cat or dog is going to get a hit of insulin that is acting way too quickly for them and it won't last as long. Timing and location is also extremely important. So timing in regard to when we give the insulin and then of course where we give the insulin specifically. Insulin doses are timed to have their maximal effect near the time of blood glucose elevation. So that means that we see the highest blood glucose elevation right after a meal is given. So for this one, huge piece of information for yourself and also for clients, always, always, always give food first Make sure that the pet eats and then administer insulin. Never, ever, ever give insulin without food. If we give insulin and their blood glucose is already low because they haven't eaten and we give the insulin, then we can cause um, a diabetic coma and of course death in really severe cases. So keep that in mind. There are always little monkey wrenches that get thrown into the situation. Sometimes clients watch their dog or cat eat they give the insulin and then they realize, you know, half hour later that the cat or dog threw up their whole meal. So in those instances, always advise them to call the clinic. Sometimes we suggest immediately feeding them again, making sure that they eat. If they're not eating, you can put some corn syrup on their mucous membranes to help that glucose get absorbed into their bloodstream. And then of course, if they're showing any signs of hypoglycemia, like uh, ataxia, just sort of where they look a little bit out of it, a change in mentation, they need to bring their pet in immediately because they likely need to be supplemented with IV glucose. When it comes to location, a few things should be considered. Of course, consider the owner's ability. 
So if you're telling the owner to get into this tiny little area on the cat's back leg, but the cat doesn't like to have its leg extended, blah, 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 then your client compliance will decrease. So consider their abilities. Are they able to grasp the cat's scruff and give an injection there? If so, that's perfect. Does the cat or dog have long hair? In a lot of cases, we need to shave a little patch for them to give the insulin so that they can confirm that it actually goes under the skin and not just into the fur. Also, we have to consider how big is the animal? Do they have a good sub -Q space? Are they really fat? Do they have really tight musculature that's just sticking to their skin? So we want to make sure that we're not going into the muscle and not going into the fat and just going under the skin. So these are all conversations to have with your clients when you're demonstrating to them how to give insulin. And it's all so, so important in the appropriate absorption of insulin. So there's also this option of managing diabetes with diet, and it just depends on the animal. Sometimes we are able to start them off on insulin injections, and then over a period of weeks or months, slowly transition them to a diet alone. So the diets that we're looking at, any animal that's diabetic should be eating a diet that has high protein and low carbohydrates. So definitely pretty much nothing from the pet store. Specifically, the goal is low glucose in the diet, and that includes treats, that includes things like carrots, which have a lot of glucose. All those things can, of course, add to the level of glucose in the blood and cause big challenges with regulating that blood sugar. High level of success generally reported in veterinary medicine using Purina DM, so dietetic management with cats. This is now the go-to for um, diabetic management through diet alone. In general, the little rule is that cats are better managed with diet alone than with dogs. So that's one benefit to cats are little weirdos that are always different than dogs. There's always a question too regarding oral hypoglycemics because in people we tend to use these things called sulfonylureal drugs and they are oral hypoglycemics. The goal of these is to stimulate the beta cells of the pancreas to produce more insulin, which would be great because if we could give a liquid or even a pill once a day instead of an injection, that would be great. That'd be totally great. However, unfortunately, it's great for humans. It's inapplicable for dogs. They just simply don't work on dogs. And there's only a tiny little percentage of cats that they actually work for. So realistically, they look amazing, they sound like they'd be such a good idea, but they just don't work in animals the way they do with people. So let's move on to adrenal gland diseases. Adrenal gland diseases, of course, affect the adrenal gland, which is this tiny little gland sitting on the cranial aspect of the kidneys. So looking at a close-up, we have the cortex and the medulla. The cortex secretes different types of hormones, which are affected by the adrenal corticotropic hormone, also called ACTH, which is secreted by the pituitary gland, and the medulla. So I'm just going to connect this back. So going back to primary, secondary, and tertiary thyroid disease, you can see how if it's primary and secondary with the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, if they're not functioning, all these other hormone producing glands won't be functioning. So again, primary hyper or hypothyroidism is, is the most beneficial. All right, back to adrenal gland. The medulla operates on the sympathetic nervous system. So the adrenal corticotropic hormones we're talking about mostly are aldosterone, which helps to control blood pressure. And we remember this through the renin angiotensin aldosterone loop of the kidney to maintain blood pressure. And cortisol helps regulate metabolism in response to stress through the exchange of electrolytes and the balancing of electrolytes. The first one we're going to talk about is hyperadrenocorticism, which is Cushing's disease. And of course, We'll talk about what it is specifically in a second. The clinical signs associated with Cushing's disease are pendulous abdomen, hair loss, increased, pigment in, uh, increased pigmentation in the skin, polyuria, polydipsia. We tend to see a stress leukogram, so they're reacting to stress, increase in neutrophils, decrease in lymphocytes, and their blood work. We tend to get lipemic or white serum. We tend to get hyperglycemia and an increase in cholesterol. So looking at Cushing's disease, it is overall an increased production of cortisol from the adrenal cortex, and cortisol synthetically is cortisone, so if we can link those together. Three causes exist 
Pituitary gland tumors are responsible for 80 to 90% of the Cushing's disease that we see in veterinary medicine. And this causes the pituitary gland to overproduce ACTH, which of course causes cas this cascade effect, which causes the adrenal gland to overproduce cortisol. An adrenal gland tumor, so a tumor on the adrenal gland itself, could be malignant or benign tumor, and surgical removal is an option for these. However, if it's malignant, there's a poor long-term prognosis. And then, of course, we have iatrogenic, which means, oopsies, we caused it, typically through the use or the prolonged use of steroids or high dosages of steroids. For diagnosis, we typically are using an ACTH stimulation test. Sometimes we also do a low-dose dexamethasone uh, suppression test. So overall, we're looking at influxes and changes to cortisol levels and the suppression of dexamethasone to understand if the adrenal gland is functioning appropriately in regard to its role with Cushing's disease. Also, too, very valuable tool is an ultrasound, an abdominal ultrasound, because again, we know that 80 to 90% of the Cushing's is a pituitary gland tumor. We're not going to ultrasound all the way up in the pituitary gland, but we could at least rule out an adrenal gland tumor through the use of an ultrasound. So the list goes on to determine which form of Cushing's this is. That's the challenge with Cushing's. If it's a pituitary gland tumor, then that's one thing. We can diagnose it after a whole pathway of tests. Adrenal gland tumor, etc. The challenge is that you don't just do one test and get an answer. One test typically leads to another test, which typically leads to another test, and then perhaps to another test. So it's a little bit challenging. We have to keep this in mind when talking to the owner about that whole pathway of testing to identify Cushing's disease. It can be very expensive for the owner, but it can give valuable information to the prognosis in the long term uh, for their pet. Treatment, so if it's a pituitary gland tumor, then what we're typically going to use, we have one of two drugs that we'll use. One of them is trilostane, which is also known as Veterol. It's an inhibitory synthetic steroid analog, and it interferes with the production of cortisol. It's dose-dependent and reversible, and it can be used in horses as well as, as dogs and cats. Low dose twice a day or every 12 hours is preferred to a higher dose once a day. Sometimes it takes a delayed onset for the full effect to be seen, and this could be two to four weeks before the cortisol levels in the blood actually decrease. Typically, this is regarded as safer than lysodrin, which we'll talk about in a minute. The challenge is we have to be cautious of drug interactions. So you have to be cautious of things like ACE inhibitors and spironolactone because we can get an overall increase in potassium with this drug. And then of course, combined with the others, we, we start to watch out for those cardiac symptoms. Then we have lysogen, which is metatane. This one is much, it's much different. So it doesn't just block that sort of creation of cortisol. It's an adrenal cytotoxic drug. So what that means is it goes in, is absorbed to the adrenal gland and starts destroying cells in the adrenal gland with the hope to reduce the production of cortisol. It's actually derived from the insecticide DDT and it has this induction period of higher dosaging, so a period of daily treatments for 7 to 10 days, then on to weekly oral treatments from there. The induction phase creates this huge rapid decrease of cortisol in the body, and cortisol plays a huge role in electrolyte balance and uh, maintenance of organs and tissues during periods of stress. We have to be very cautious, especially in small dogs during this inductive phase, because we can start to see signs of rapid decrease of cortisol or essentially switching them into hypoadrenocorticism. So the effects that we can see are GI effects, so vomiting diarrhea and anorexia, and then in rare cases, a full-blown Addisonian crisis. Generally, we can decrease the chances of this happening by switching to an 8-12 to 12 hour interval for the induction period instead of once a day. Overall too, lysogen definitely has some drug interactions. So of course it has like amplified effects or additive effects when combined with other central nervous system drugs. It increases the enzymatic metabolism of phenobarbital in the liver, 
and phenobarbital also increases the metabolism of lysadrin. So when an animal is given either phenobarbital or lysadrin, they start to accumulate greater abundance of these um, enzymes that break down the drugs in the liver which to some degree is great because it helps them metabolize and process, but at the same time, the longer they're on it, the more enzymes they're producing. So it starts breaking down the medication faster than we want. Diabetic patients can have rapidly changing blood glucose through the induction phase, so the insulin dosage changes may be necessary. Spironolactone blocks the effects of lysadrin as well, so if we have an animal on spironolactone for congestive heart failure, then of course high caution has to be taken as to whether or not lysadrin is the appropriate drug for that animal. Another one that we talked about was anapril or acelagiline. It's an MAO inhibitor and it has a different mode of action than the other drugs. So we talked about this previously in the last lecture, but it prevents the reuptake or breakdown of dopamine in the brain. So this of course allows dopamine to have an extended effect on the brain. Dopamine, how it relates to the endocrine system, dopamine inhibits the creation of ACTH in the pituitary gland and of course this creates a cascade effect which eventually inhibits the production of cortisol. Unfortunately with anapril as the primary drug for Cushing's disease, studies aren't particularly supportive for the use of anapril alone. Common side effects, you can get gastrointestinal, so vomiting and diarrhea. The recommendation is to stop the medication, wait, and then start again at a lower dose. You can also get CNS stimulation with anapril. So again, watching out for which drugs, which other drugs the animal is on is key. Some rare side effects that can happen is deafness, paritis, and shivering. You do need a washout period, sometimes weeks in between, between MAO inhibitors and other uh, central nervous system drugs. So the washout period, again, for animals is going to be dependent on the animal itself and the availability of their metabolism. We also have to be very cautious with the interactions of some of those uh, behavior-modifying drugs that could lead to serotonin syndrome and even beyond behavior modifying, even things like metoclopramide and tramadol. So you have to watch out for that because of course that can, the, when we have many of them or two of them in the system or higher doses, then we can get into serotonin syndrome. Opioid use, we need to wash out time as well. And then we have Paraglide. Trade name is Paramax or Prescend. In Canada, you're most often going to see it as Prescend by Boehringer Ingelheim. And this is for the equine treatment of Cushing's. So it has the same idea as Anapril, but it tends to work quite well in horses, more so than Anapril does in dogs and cats. It's a dopamine agonist, which again allows dopamine to maintain itself and uh, create more dopamine in the brain to have a greater effect on the body and it is an oral daily dosage. Overall Cushing's monitoring, we have to closely monitor the clinical signs and blood work. So in the first six weeks we should definitely be looking at some blood work to identify what the cortisol levels are at and of course always asking the owner to monitor for any of those signs such as polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, etc, etc. All right, moving on, we've got Addison's disease, also called hyperadrenocorticism. So Addison's disease is a mineral corticoid, mineralocorticoid, and glucocorticoid deficiency. So overall, it's a deficiency of various um, hormones in the body. So it's an imbalance of aldosterone and cortisol that we're looking at, and this results in a hyponatremia, so a low sodium, and hyperkalemia or high potassium, as well as a cortisol deficiency. Causes? Most often they're looking at immune-mediated destruction of the adrenal cortex, so it's just simply not producing enough cortisol and aldosterone. The drug-induced necrosis is also one, so with long-term use of metatan, we can start to see drug-induced necrosis, and that's that cytotoxic effect. And then enzyme inhibitions for the use of trilostane can happen over time as well. Likewise, another cause, of course, can be neoplasia. Now, when it comes to the clinical signs of Addison's, this one is such a weird one for the doctors to diagnose. So they really have to have Addison's in mind when they're looking at the patient. Otherwise, their clinical signs could be for anything. So every single thing that's a clinical sign in the world could be a clinical sign for Addison's. We've got things like weakness, depression, loss of appetite, vomiting, diarrhea, PU, PD, muscle tremors, severe hypovolemia, 
arrhythmias, <laughs> and on and on. It's crazy. So typically what the client reports, normally we're seeing these pets in crisis. So they end up coming in in a full hypovolemic shock. So they have zero blood pressure. They're severely hypovolemic, hypotensive, and they just aren't doing well. They actually look like they're going to die. Typically they have a really crazy arrhythmia or a murmur. So some interesting artifacts in their heart. And then when we get a client history, you know, typically it's like, yeah, she was fine. And then the other day, you know, she had this weird episode where she started limping or yeah, like three weeks ago she had some diarrhea, but then she was fine. Or yeah, for the last year she gets diarrhea like every other month. Those can be the clinical signs that are so easy to miss. Totally easy to miss because it looks like a dog, any dog in the world that just has occasional diarrhea. So Addison's is really challenging my example that I'll talk about was my dog, Leia, and I'll, I'll talk about her in a minute. She was great Pyrenees, and Addison's is really common in female dogs around two to four years old, female dogs. So Leia, we had her for about a year. She was two and a half, and she had intermittent diarrhea, just random intermittent diarrhea. Okay, that's fine. It would go away for a month, then it would come back. And every so often, she would throw up. So she'd vomit like every few months, maybe some months she'd vomit every week, that kind of thing. And then one day she started limping. I'm like, oh no, it's, you know, she did something to her soft tissue. The next day she'd be limping on the other leg. And then it started to get a little bit weird. She started to not eat as much. And that Monday she had this huge episode of muscle spasms and muscle tremors all over her body. It looked like she was having a seizure, but it was muscle spasms and tremors. And then immediately after that, she had a grade four heart murmur, which was really scary. So that was Monday. I recall it well. It was exam week. By Friday, when I brought her to work at the college, she couldn't even walk. So she couldn't walk. She was not eating. She just couldn't move, couldn't lift her head. We had to do a cut down on a Great Pyrenees to get a vein, which is crazy. And she had a non-registrable blood pressure. So of course she was shipped to the emergency clinic ASAP. And through the weekend, they diagnosed it as Addison's disease. Okay, so really crazy, really random symptoms. The doctor has to have Addison's disease in the back of their head in order to create a diagnosis or else they'll never catch it clinical signs. So I talked about many of them. And then laboratory signs, the key findings, definitely we get blood decrease in blood glucose, decrease in sodium and an increase in potassium. So they end up with a low sodium potassium ratio. So if it's a regular clinic, not all regular clinics have the availability of electrolytes or sodium potassium in general. So sometimes, you know, it's that extra period of time before the dog can get diagnosed with Addison's disease which is scary. Clinically, also you're going to see a really severely decreased blood pressure because their aldosterone is not being produced at adequate levels. Irregular heart rate because of that exchange of sodium and potassium or imbalance of sodium and potassium and really severe hydration, again, because they're not regulating their electrolytes appropriately. If they show up in crisis, the treatment, of course, is supportive care right away. The key here is to correct the hypovolemia, hypotension, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, cardiac arrhythmias, hypoglycemia, and of course the acidosis that will start to kick in when all of these are poorly balanced. No big deal, you know, just have to correct all those things. Then, of course, if it's definitely the doctor's confirmed, they're sure that it's Addison's, then they'll get a steroid to start replacing some of the effects of those missing ster uh, hormones. So they'll get typically an IV dexamethasone injection. For long-term treatment, we're going to get a mineral mineralocorticoid, which is given to correct the hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and hypokalemia, so, or chloremia, so a low chloride. We're going to give them a DOCP, which is, a, of course, a mineralocorticoid, desoxycorticosterone pivolate. So that is a big word to say. Of course, DOCP is typically what we call it. Now, in regard to drugs, there are two options typically available to us. Procortin V is a DOCP and fludrocortisone as well. And we'll get into the ups and downs of both. Procortin V. So this is a mineralocorticoid that increases the reabsorption of sodium in the nephron, 
and increases the excretion of potassium. So in that ace, uh, ascending loop of Henle, as well as the proximal convoluted tubule, we're going to start to see that exchange of sodium and potassium. It encourages fluid into the cellular space to reduce the chances of hypovolemia. However, caution, we're relying heavily on the nephrons of the kidney to work when we're giving this medication. So if the animal has poorly functioning kidneys or renal disease, then of course that exchange of sodium and potassium isn't going to be very effective. Likewise, caution with congestive heart failure and edema in patients, because again, this one is the, one of the goals is to encourage fluid into the cellular space. We're include, encouraging fluid into that cellular space of the body overall. If they already have a highly congested heart, or if they're experiencing any form of edema, we don't want any more fluid coming into the body. Likewise, too, we have to be cautious that we don't want to swing into hypokalemia and hypernatremia, so we want to make sure that the dosing is correct, and sometimes gastrointestinal side effects have been reported as well. Client considerations, careful monitoring of the blood levels of the electrolytes in the first year of treatment is key, because again, if we're giving a dose that's too high for that specific animal, then we can swing them into the opposite, and we're going to get cardiac issues all over again. We want to check blood levels at 14 days and at 25 days for those electrolytes. 14 days will tell us about the dosing, so if the dosage is appropriate for that animal. And 25 days will tell us about the frequency of injection. So is the cortisol, or not the cortisol, are the electrolytes well balanced still at 25 days as they were at 14 days? Injections, it's recommended to do an intramuscular injection. You can go under the skin as well. So this often includes a whole visit to the vet, depending on the owner. Have to shake this solution very well. That's just a side note. It's a very thick white solution, and it tends to accumulate at the bottom of the vial. So you want to ensure that that's well mixed in order to confirm that they get their full dose. And then likewise, we can't just get away with a once monthly injection we also typically have to give a glucocorticoid in many animals. So along with this mineralocorticoid treatment, that is about once every 25 to 28 days, we also have to give them typically every other day glucocorticoid replacement. So I love Percortin. I used Percortin with my dog Leia. The challenge with Percortin, and boy, she was an expensive dog, so the challenge with Percortin is the cost. The dosaging for Percortin is typically 1.65 to 2.2 mg per kg every 25 to 28 days, so that's great. It's only once a month. I like that. But Leia was 60 kilograms, so Leia needed 3.96 mL up to 5.28 mL once a month. One vial of Percortin is 4 mL, and it's $250.91 at cost. So we have to keep this in mind because it's an extremely convenient option for clients. I loved it and it worked really well with my dog, but it is cost inhibitive for many people. So if they have pet insurance and a giant dog, totally go for Percortin. If they have a Chihuahua, go for Percortin, absolutely. But if they have a dog that's quite big and you know they're not going to be able to afford, you know, three or four hundred dollars every single month, then perhaps this drug is not for them. So the dollar factor here is, of course, what's at play to prevent a lot of people from using Percortin. Flutrocortisone then is their other option. So it's also known as Florinef as the trade name, or we get it compounded. Now, when we get it compounded, I I'll talk about the strength. Typically, it's 0.1 mg per pill, but I think compounding they'll go up to 0.2 or 0.3 mg per pill, which is kind of nice for bigger dogs. It has the exact same action as Percortin V, same action, it's a mineralocorticoid. It's given twice a day orally, so every 12 hours, and it has that same precautions regarding kidney disease, congestive heart failure, and edema. Consideration, client compliance. It's every day, twice a day, for life. So again, keep in mind what happens when these animals don't get their medication. Sometimes we have to have a chat with the owner if they're not giving the medication, and we have to remind them how badly off their pet was when they were in crisis, because nobody wants to see their pet looking half dead going into an emergency clinic. But that's what Addisonian animals look like when they're in crisis. So if they are not able to give a medication by mouth twice a day for life, this is not the medication for their pet. 
It is much less expensive than Percortin V, which makes it affordable and accessible for a higher number of clients. The challenge here as well is it comes in that 0.1 milligram tablet, which of course is challenging for a large breed dog. And of course, sometimes too, they get used to it and we may need to increase the dosage over time. So your typical dosaging that we're looking at is 0.02 mg per cake per day. And I think, I can't remember what it goes up to. I think it was up to 0.5 mg per cakes per day. So, or 0.05 or 0.05, either way, it goes up from there. So Leia, that 60 kilogram Great Pyrenees, needed roughly 12 tablets up to 60 tablets daily. And I think when we tried to figure out her dosaging based on what it was with Percortin, she needed 10 tablets twice a day. So that's too much. That's way too much. Again, in general, smaller dogs and animals that are smaller with Addisonian disease are better off in a financial aspect and compliance aspect for their owners. It's the really big dogs that we start getting into trouble with medications. And then lastly, as part of treatment for Addison's, they typically need supplementation of a glucocorticoid. Some dogs are able to be weaned off the glucocorticoid, but a lot of them need supportive factors of the, the prednisone or prednisolone. So typically we're looking at a very tiny dose, 0.05 to 0.22 mg per kg per day, and it's used to control the non-specific signs of Addison's disease through hormone supplementation. Prednisone typically starts at a higher dose, and then we're able to wean them down to every other day is the goal. And a lot of times we need to increase their dose of prednisone or glucocorticoids during times of high stress. So if we think about what Addison's disease is, they're not producing cortisol and they're producing either very little or no aldosterone. So what ends up happening? Cortisol allows them to react physiologically appropriately to stress. So if an animal is undergoing a high stress situation, we tend to have to compensate with prednisone, increase their dose of prednisone to help support that overall synthesis of those hormones. So dogs that are really high stress, really, really high stress, have a really hard time with Addison's and with regulating themselves on Addison's or with Addison's on the medication. If we go back to Leia, that great Pyrenees that we had, I talked about her in the last lecture because she had crazy separation anxiety, she had crazy firework anxiety, and she overall was a highly anxious dog. So you can imagine that when we left her for periods of time, when we went on vacation and she had to stay with friends, we often double dosed the prednisone every single day just to help her stabilize and maintain her, her balance of hormones and not go into an Addisonian crisis. So these guys can be challenging for sure. The key here, of course, this is all about client education. The more clients know and the more they feel empowered, the more likely they are to continue with treatment and keep you in the loop, watch for clinical signs. So we have an opportunity to offer that to the clients. And that is it. 